is I'll try to make it interactive by embedding a few questions. Uh, I'll give you a few seconds to think in your heads what you think the answer may be, uh, and then we'll talk through the answer. Now, central venous access is one of the bread and butter procedures of paediatric IR. Children do get cancer and other diseases requiring access for prolonged IV medication and blood sampling. Their veins are small, they all cry and they get distressed, so trying to manage them just on cannulas is not feasible. So this is a chest x-ray of one such child requiring central venous access. He was TPN dependent due to short bowel. So if you all have a look at this x-ray, I hope you can make out the line. The arrows are pointing to it, but also I'll just use my cursor to follow the, 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 the route of the line. Now my first question is, where is this line going? Think of the anatomical structures it's following. So just have a few seconds to think about where the root of this line is. So the line uh, initially follows the rib, so it enters one of the intercostal veins. Uh, these then drain into the zygous vein, um, and then this drains into the superior vena cava and then the right atrium. So having a good anatomical knowledge of the venous system is really important in paediatric IR. Now I hope some of you are thinking, gosh, these guys are bonkers. Why have they put a line in via that route when they could have put it in using the internal jugular or femoral veins? Now that really is a good question. So why do you think we chose that route? Just have a few seconds to think about the potential reasons. So the answer is that uh, this child had poor central access due to previous multiple lines. Now every time you meddle with a vein, there's a chance that it will block off and therefore not be available for use next time. On the left, we've got an MR venogram of the patient on the, and on the right, a venogram of a normal patient. You can see on the right, uh, a normal SVC and an IVC, but on the left, they are absent, i.e. they have occluded. There's also lots of collateral vessels on the left. So even if we'd managed to get into the internal jugular or femoral veins, we wouldn't have been able to get into the central veins. Now these are actually images of the same patient uh, where we did try to cite a left femoral venous line. You can see the iliac vein is occluded uh, where the arrow tip is and there's lots of collateral vessels. Now what we did on this occasion was to re-canalize his iliac vein using a sharp wire. You can see that we're pushing it through uh, and eventually we did manage to get through into the IVC and then into the right atrium. You can see uh, on this chest x-ray which we obtained at the end of the procedure that we did eventually manage to cite a line. This line did eventually fail which is why we then opted to go via the intercostal and the route. Now just going back to the original chest x-ray, some of you eagle-eyed ones may have spotted an abnormality on the chest x-ray. So the next question is, what is the abnormality or what complication have we caused? Think of some of the risks of poking a needle into the intercostal vein. So just have a few seconds to think about that. That's right, so unfortunately what we've caused is a tension pneumothorax. You can see that the right lung is collapsed and also there is shift of the mediastinum towards the left. So the next question is, what is the management for a tension pneumothorax? Just have a few seconds to think in your minds what you think uh, you would do to treat a pneumoth uh, tension pneumothorax. So the initial management is a large bore cannula in the second intercostal space mid axillary line attached to an underwater seal. This should then be substituted for a formal chest drain, and you can see in this chest x-ray that we have put in a chest drain and cured his pneumothorax. So central venous access is one of the commonest procedures that paediatric IR uh, performs. Um, the vast majority of these are straightforward, but there are some challenging cases, and having a good knowledge of the venous anatomy and thinking laterally with innovative ideas is helpful. It's also really important to have a good knowledge of the potential complications so you can identify and treat these quickly. Thank you. Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Hawa Iqbal and I'm one of the fourth year medical students currently studying at the University of Leeds. I'd like to start by thanking the BSPR organising committee for giving me the opportunity to present here and I'd also like to thank my co-authors Dr Nassim Tahir and Dr Jay Patel providing me with this really interesting case. So the title of my presentation is 
subclavian artery stenting following the removal of a malplaced Hickman line with pseudoaneurysm formation. Okay, so just a bit of background about the case. The patient was a 12 year old male who presented with a diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia. He required a central line placing to allow chemotherapy to be given to treat his disease. Now this was placed by a surgeon in the operating theatre and this was uh, the venous punch site was um, allegedly the right internal jugular vein and this had been performed under ultrasound guidance by the surgeon. At the end of the procedure however the surgeon was unable to aspirate any blood from the line so contrast was injected down the line under fluoroscopic guidance to try and identify why this was. Now this showed that the tip of the line was in an extravascular position. So the surgeon then proceeded to explore the neck to identify the puncture site of the line. And it was noted that the line was not in the internal jugular vein. It had in fact passed deep into the root of the neck. And the surgeon was unable to identify where the initial puncture site was. Therefore, the interventional radiologist was subsequently called and the patient was transferred to the IR department for further evaluation. So, in the IR department, a subclavian artery angiogram was performed via a right femoral artery approach. So, this showed that the Hickman line that, that had been inserted by the surgeon had actually transfixed the subclavian artery, shown here, and subsequently perforated through into the pleural cavity. So, given the position of the injury, simply pulling out the line would have led to severe bleeding due to an inability to compress the artery. Therefore, following discussion with the vascular surgeons, it was decided to facilitate line removal by performing a balloon occlusion of the artery. So a balloon was placed at the level of the injury and the line was removed. The balloon was then inflated for 20 minutes to allow hemostasis to occur. And then following this, the balloon was deflated and a check angiogram was performed. So the check angiogram shown here shows that there was an irregularity at the site of the arterial injury. However, importantly, there was no contrast extravasation seen. And in addition, the artery remained patent with a flow of contrast beyond the site of injury. So the patient was then returned to the ward. But a few weeks later, the oncologist came to discuss that the patients had the patient had had progressive breathlessness and when chest x-rays had been performed they showed a persistent right-sided loculated pleural effusion. A chest strain had been inserted and this had yielded blood-stained fluid. So the concern at this point was that there was an ongoing slow leakage of blood from that initial subclavian artery injury and so to further investigate this a contrast enhanced CT was performed. So this slide here shows selected coronal, uh, coronal and axial images from that contrast enhanced CT. And as you can see, they confirm the presence of a pseudoaneurysm at the site of arterial injury. So you can see that both here and here. So the patient then underwent a repeat subclavian angiogram to confirm the diagnosis. So this is an image from that angiogram and it does indeed confirm the presence of a pseudoaneurysm as you can see here. So we could have used a covered stent to exclude the pseudoaneurysm but there are significant risks associated with that procedure such as infection or stent migration or occlusion of the stent. Therefore it was decided to attempt another balloon, another balloon occlusion to see if this would make any difference. So a balloon was placed across the site of injury, it was inflated for 20 minutes and then a check angiogram was performed. Okay so this is an image from that angiogram and what you can see is that unfortunately the patient has now developed filling defects in the subclavian artery and also the carotid artery consistent with blood clots. Now obviously if the carotid artery um, clots embolize up to the brain this could cause a stroke. So in order to prevent this a long sheath was quickly inserted and with a combination of small aliquots of TPA to help dissolve the clots and with aspiration, the blood clots were removed. So here you can see a further check angiogram had been performed and thankfully 
This shows that all the clots have been removed and that the carotid, subclavian and vertebral arteries all remain patent. Now, cerebral angiogram was also performed, which confirmed that there was no thrombus within the cerebral circulation. Okay, so finally, a covered stent was deployed to exclude the pseudoaneurysm. And as you can see, this was placed successfully without any further sequelae. Now, this angiogram here shows the position of the stent. It shows that it has successfully excluded the pseudoaneurysm and patency of the vertebral and subclavian arteries have been achieved. So the patient made a very good recovery. Uh, subsequent chest x-ray changes showed that um, the initial issues had been resolved and he had no neurological sequelae. So he's currently well and he remains in remission from his AML. Okay, so here are a few learning points from the case. Firstly, it's important to note that the procedures used to treat complications can themselves cause complications. And so it's vital that operators are number one, aware of this, and number two, are proactive in identifying these to prevent further patient morbidity. Secondly, pseudoaneurysm formation can be a complication following any arterial injury. And we see these most commonly in the femoral artery following femoral angiograms. But in this case, we can see that the, pseudoane the pseudoaneurysm occurred at the site of the subclavian artery. Thirdly, stroke can be a complication in interventions of the subclavian artery. Therefore, operators should ensure that patients are adequately consented for this. So, these are some of the references I used to prepare for this presentation. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And please do not hesitate to contact me or my co-authors if you have any questions or comments. So thank you very much for listening.